Um, because our first guest uh, is a co-founder, Bitch Media, 23 years, uh, and wrote a book in 2016 called We Were Feminists Once, From Riot Girl to Cover Girl. Uh, she has also written for New York Times, Washington Post, Salon, Time, Ms., the Los Angeles Review of Books. Yeah, this is another badass bitch. Please welcome Andy Zeisler. Yeah! I went, I got my hair cut the other day and I was like, well, I just, I'm doing this thing. I want to look exactly like the host. Yeah, so. and you're like, give me the Stacey yeah. now. Give me the Stacey. It's like the Rachel of the 90s. Yeah, exactly. It's awesome. Am I saying your last name correctly? Zeisler. Zeisler. Yeah. Okay, good. I just want to, I got, you know, that like moment of like, did I say it It's right? fine. I you answered to it whatever. Because you're so yeah. accomplished <laughs> and so impressive. So great to have you here. Uh, a Portland, you've been doing this for 23 years. Yeah. Yep. And, and so what was the impetus and, and original mission of Bitch Media? Um, well, we, my co-founders and I spent a lot of time consuming popular culture. We loved it, you know, movies and magazines. And I mean, we started in 1995, so it just, the amount of pop culture seems like really like a, a fraction of what is available now. Right. Um, but we really wanted to talk about the fact that that's where yeah, yeah. most people that's sort of get their, the that's sort of like their conduit for the world. That's how they find out about things, information. They find out, you know, who they want to be. Um, Did you start with the magazine? Yeah, we was started. Was it a zine? It was a zine. Yeah, yes. zine. That's how we did it in the yeah, 90s. Ones, uh, 90s. <laughs> so let me explain real quickly. A zine was a thing you printed and you printed out and then you cut oh. out and then you taped to pieces of paper and you had your friend copy at Kinko's late at night. Yeah. No, you know, it was a it was, way that it was could, Tumblr and on yeah, the page. It, yeah. it was. It was yeah. pre-internet. The way that alternative culture people found each other. Yes, really. exactly. Yeah, uh, in a, in a nicer way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember running off a lot of copies of zines late at yeah, night. Yeah, you know, yeah. Never, never pay full that price was, at Yeah, because you had friends who worked at Kinko's because exactly. they were musicians. And yeah, it was a yeah. whole ecosystem of helping each other out. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so when did it evolve into magazine? Um, gosh, I don't even remember. I think it was probably five or six years into it where we all had sort of corporate day jobs and at some point, we realized we were working our day jobs, going home, working on bitch, working on bitch on the weekends. And, you know, we were relative babies at the time. No, you know, we didn't have like mortgages or partners or kids or anything. Uh, but we, we did start to burn out. And at a certain point, it was like, well, we either have to do this full time or we just stop doing it. And so we sort of took that plunge with a lot of help uh, from you know, various organizations and And, and it people. is a nonprofit? Yes, we're a reader supported nonprofit. We have the, the sort of public radio model of, uh, you know, you can be a monthly um, donor and get all sorts of cool swag and, you know. It still works that way today. Yeah, yeah, it works that way today. And, Which is um, amazing. and I think yeah. it's interesting what you're saying because I do think it's hard for people who grew up in the internet age to realize how limited and the number of outlets were at the time in the 90s. Yeah. There were three channels, you know, cable was just starting to right. emerge. And so really everyone was watching stuff, good, bad, or ugly, and yeah, it was Yeah, it was controlled. much more of like a monoculture. Like yeah. everyone knew what everyone else was watching or talking about. Yeah, and er so everything that was produced was had a bigger impact, and there was much less opportunity for more fringy people to, to find each other and communicate. And what's the mission of, of the nonprofit itself? Uh, the mission for, of the nonprofit is to provide uh, an informed feminist response to popular culture and media and to highlight um, people who are creating feminist media. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's something that, you know, we were definitely part of a zeitgeist when we started because um, with the advent of the internet, all of a sudden people who cared about pop culture 
could really care in public. And that really, you know, and all of a sudden you were like, oh, the New York Times is talking about television like it's important, or like the Wall Street Journal is recapping TV shows. And so it very much, like we were very much part of a movement where, where people were like, yeah, you know what, this isn't just entertainment. Like this is our lives, it reflects our lives, it impacts, uh, it, it impacts what other stuff is made. Um, it's important. And so I think we're still very much in that place, um, but we are able to, uh, we have a little, we have a few more resources with which to do it. Um, and there's, again, so much more to talk about that, you know, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's yeah. A, yeah, and there's I'm, so much more to talk about, and the world is on fire. So, right. You know. right. <laughs> Literally it's, and figuratively. Yeah. So it's perfect. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what I like is that you describe yourself as a fan of pop culture. You love pop culture, and all of you loved it. So it must have been a love hate relationship would you say, or you just love it and want to encourage it well, to become more inclusive? Yeah, I think, you know, I think if you love something, you want it to be better. Like, you don't want to, um, you see the potential. And if it falls short in terms of representation or in terms of, you know, the breadth of the stories that it tells, you want to see it do more. And that's sort of where we were at. What and, do you uh, like? Like, you like movies mainly? You like TV? You like all of it? Um, I love movies, but I'm also extremely lazy and I hate to leave my house. So, uh, <laughs> TV has been like the whole like golden age of TV and yeah. streaming. That's just that's been my shit. What's your favorite show? Oh my god. Um, or you know, I'm not gonna make you stick to one. Yeah. No, <laughs> I some of your favorites like in the there's past. yeah there's so much that I love. Um, you know, I feel like. Um, Game of Thrones is sort of the closest thing we have to that. <laughs> but it's not a shame. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's like the closest thing we have to that sort of like water cooler experience where like a critical mm. mass of people is watching it and has like, you know, everyone's got such really amazing like theories about it and you can just nerd out My in a way that. My works at a bar and the night that it, the first episode came on, it was like packed, full of families, and then mm -hmm. 745, dead. <laughs> dead. Everyone was yeah. home. They were like, Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones. Thrones. I know, go. you gotta get the kids in bed, yeah. Um, I'm a big, like, Michael Schur fan. Yeah. Uh, so, Parks and Rec, and uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and now The Good Place. Brooklyn Nine-Nine, I'm so happy that, like, people have, I feel like, you know, it was a sleeper. It, it was a sleeper. Yeah. And I just, I love it. And it's funny because I, um, I don't know if this is just the crowd I run with, but like people I know are very divided on Andy Samberg. Mm. And I've, I've always been like full Andy Samberg. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, <laughs> and Terry Crews. And everyone is just, it's so good. And The Good Place, I mean, it's such a good show for these times. It I is. mean, it sounds cheesy, but like, but the we should all be talking about we, ethics. We, we should, should all be talking about that That's stuff. That's right. And the idea that no matter how good you try to be, you can't be. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, this person bought this person flowers. What a great gesture. But the flowers <laughs> were delivered over thousands of miles and burned this right. much fuel yeah. and were grown in sweatshops in a greenhouse in China. Yep. And like, yeah. you know, you, uh, any good effort you try to make is undone by, you know, the way our culture is set yeah. up, that it's yeah. almost impossible unless you live in a cabin and grow your own food. and. Uh, and then, you and know, even then, to do that. you know, because yeah. you have to get the tools from somewhere, and right, right, it's a right. whole thing. And as a, as a, as a as a woman in a nonprofit world, I of course feel kindred spirit to Leslie Nope. <laughs> yes, as I think a lot of women do. Which I think the the Parks and Rec underlying theme is no good deed goes unpunished. Yes, that's what I feel like is the. Uh, the theme of that, which sounds dark and yet is validating and reassuring. <laughs> well, I think it's also that like everyone's sort of in the same boat. So it's like you can identify with characters that you don't really have that much in common with, like politically or socially, mm -hmm. but you're sharing the kind of um, quotidian like frustration with bureaucracy mm -hmm. and- uh, That's a reference to Don Quixote. 
tilt in it. Yeah, well. exactly. They got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did they? <laughs> oh, now look who's throwing out the obscure references. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this one. <laughs> Uh, it's a, it's amazing. Now you you know you've really seen feminism evolve in your time and focusing on it. What are the the changes that you have seen over time? I mean, we started we started bitch in large part because um, magazines like Ms that had started out with a focus on uh, sort of getting people to understand why pop culture can be sort of a locus of progressive thought and activism, they'd stopped doing that by a certain time in the early 90s. Um, and so, honestly, we just we were just frustrated readers. We wanted to read people talking about the stuff that we were into. And at the time, you know, nobody wanted to be associated with feminism. Um, I think the biggest change, certainly in the past, uh, you know, two decades, is that feminism is cool again. Like. That was not the case in the early 90s. Like, celebrities were not rushing to call themselves feminists. Like, if anything, they were like rushing away from it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just the, the optics of feminism and the, the fact that, you know, the first contact uh, that a lot of young people have with feminism is it is a very positive contact you know they they see beyonce or they see emma watson and then they associate feminism with something that's cool and that people are you know very invested in and that is important to the world whereas you know i grew up in a time where it was like oh if you're a feminist uh you you're wearing an acid wash vest and you're going to cut that guy's penis off just because <laughs> um and so, you know, that's an important change. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a question. So, um, <laughs> um, so like, it's bitch media, and then mm -hmm. there was this, I remember, I mean, like, maybe five, six, seven years ago of, like, trying to be like, this is not a word that we use anymore. Have you experienced that, and have people come at you for that? I mean, people have always come at us um, for the name, and I think... In a lot of ways, I think it's generational um, because when we started, bitch was still very much like one of those like seven words you couldn't say on TV. I think maybe it had started being used, maybe like you heard it on like NYPD Blue once in a while, <laughs> um, but it wasn't used in the way that we hear it used now. Whether it's like affectionately or you know, using the word bitch to refer to everything, inanimate objects, clubs, whatever. Um, and so I think we had this idea that bitch may be as kind of an analog to the way that uh, LGBTQ communities had reclaimed queer. We we're like, maybe we can reclaim it. You mm -hmm. know, maybe we can reclaim it as uh, something that's powerful and meaningful. And um, I don't think that. <laughs> I don't think that happened. Um, <laughs> just, <laughs> we were young. I mean, because some of the, the biggest haters on that movement were feminists. Exactly, yeah. And I think um, over the years, it really was um, a lot of uh, feminists who had come of age during the second wave in the 60s and 70s who were like, you know, we fought so hard to not be called that word. And, you know, it's so upsetting that you're putting it back out there. And, you know, I, I think we, I certainly absolutely was very sympathetic to that um, and really was always happy to engage in conversation about it. But at the same time, um, you know, we really wanted to make a case that language can be flexible um, and that just because someone is using a word in a derogatory term um, they, they shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't have control over how it's used in every case. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, definitely every time I go to a lot of colleges and universities to speak, and the first question is inevitably, why did you call it bitch? And I just, I, I feel like I should just get a t-shirt that has like, you know, like the beginning of Star Wars, where it's just like the whole explanation. <laughs> in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> it means so many things though, you know? It does. Like, and two bitch, and two. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I feel like as I get 
so when I, you know, when I was younger, in my 20s, and like all growing up, I'm a very fiery person. I'm from Boston, and I'm Syrian, and Italian, and Portuguese, and I'm an Aries. Like, everything's against me in terms of, I'm like, ah, fire! And, uh, and then to get, it's a, my therapist has this really cool way of sort of breaking the world down into, like, what you want, self-respect, and relationships. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I got into my 30s and I had some things that I really wanted, I learned I had to really temper my fire and be more diplomatic, mm -hmm. which I think is an important emotional maturity thing to learn. But I almost overcompensated and really tampered my fire to a point uh, just to get along and to get what I want and maintain those relationships. But after a while, your own self-respect starts to dwindle. And I read this book on um, willpower recently, and they talk about controlling your emotions is, is a self-control, you know, it's, it's part of willpower. And after a while, if, if they made people watch Terms of Endearment and told them they couldn't cry, and they what? told some other people watch Terms of Endearment and they could express their emotions freely, and then afterwards they had both groups try to solve this unsolvable puzzle that they didn't tell them was unsolvable. And the people who had to try to control their emotions way sooner were like, fuck this puzzle. <laughs> well, because anyone who doesn't stuff. cry in terms of endearment is obviously a sociopath. Right. <laughs> like, he can't... And, like, trying to contain your emotions yeah. or tamper your fire or tamper your emotions it eventually makes your patience go away. And being a big person and being able to set boundaries patiently or to patiently deal with all the disrespects that you have throughout the day, it fucking wears you down after a while. And you bitch. <laughs> and like, I think I was so terrified of being a bitch. And as I'm getting older, uh, I don't care as much. And, I, yeah. and I'm trying to let it back in. Yeah. Well, that is the beauty of but age. It's, hard. it's still hard, though. Yeah. You know, like I see the repercussions, and I'm like, oh, it bothers me, but only a little. <laughs> Not as much as it used to. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's sort of the, yeah, that's sort of the wonder of, of getting older and you know there's a um, there have been studies on this about how you know women's brains as they age um, you know they it's sort of the estrogen recedes the testosterone gets more plentiful and you know you enter your fuck all y'all years which yeah. is um, I think I'm in I'm 46 I feel like I entered them when I'm when I was 45 okay it's like it's I'm the, 48, so yeah. I'm in there now. Well, then, you know, it's the, it's the fuck all y'all years, and then it's the goddess years. The, like the caftan. I know. Like, I'm, I'm, into, I'm, so I'm looking forward to, to that. the caftan. Yeah. <laughs> don't. Embrace it. I don't want to do the shawls and the caftan. Oh, really? See, no. I feel like I've been waiting my whole life for that. Maybe that's what I'm missing. Maybe yeah. that's what I... You know, when my grandmother was 88 years old, she went into... This is my favorite inspirational story of her entire life. She went to buy a pair of shoes, and they make shoes between sizes, and they're like, do you take these pair, you wear them around, even outside, and if they don't fit... You know, that you can bring them back and exchange them. And so they didn't, she didn't like them. She brought them back and the person started arguing, you warm outside, blah, blah, blah. And my aunt's like, they said that they could. My grandma just took the other pair and started walking out. <laughs> <laughs> and my aunt was like, what are you doing? She's like, what are they gonna do, arrest me? And just fucking left. She was like, fuck you. <laughs> well, that's the other yeah. thing. It's like older women, you become invisible. <laughs> And you could just start doing crimes. Yeah. Like <laughs> you know. <laughs> what I loved was during the work bitch segment, that was the most specific female laughter I heard. <laughs> like every woman in here was laughing hard. And one dude was like, yeah, I'm sick of being nice. <laughs> like, yeah, you went to Oberlin. Yeah, you know, so. All right, you, I, I just, let's go get coffee sometime. Yes. I could talk to you for hours. Yeah. I'm so excited. We have one thing we want to do. We want to play a game. We play a game uh, with our guests. Uh, and uh, we came up with a very special <laughs> game uh, to play with you. You're going to need this. Nice. All right. Uh, and this is a game that we like to call Smash the Patriarchy! Yeah! yeah! Smash it! Yeah! <laughs> Where do I start? <laughs> Where do I start? Oh my god! Yes! 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 <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. And just so you all know, what you get, <laughs> what you get when you smash the patriarchy is representation. Recognition, the right to be mediocre, this is a good power, one. Yeah. money, Respect. and free candy for everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you so for Andy. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah.